this video, we're looking at categorical probabilities laid out on a two-way table. And it's very similar to what we did with the one-way table scenario. Again, we're looking at um, a hypothesis testing procedure, and we're looking at, essentially, data that was collected from a multinomial experiment of sorts, right? So in this problem, I've given an example, pretty trivial example, but interesting in and of itself. It says chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry on this uh, set of categories, and then it has male and female. So you see there's kind of a cross-categorization here. So every cell has two different categories. That was different from before, you know, like this 225 is the chocolate ice cream and the male category at once, right? Whereas before we didn't have this second listing, we just had chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, and we'd only have one set of numbers there underneath each category. Here though, however, we have sort of uh, two categories that are being listed. We have one which involves the sex of the person who was surveyed, and then the other is their preference among these three cardinal ice cream flavors. So kind of the classic ice cream flavor is the one you would find in a Napoleon ice cream box. Um, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, they surveyed these people, a thousand people actually, 500 men, 500 women, and they asked them to pick their favorite flavor among these three flavors, and you had uh, males and females responding in these particular ways. So the idea behind this study is to figure out if, this is what our HO and HA are generically for all problems that involve the two-way tables here, that the two classifications are independent. In this case, we're saying that you know, the choice of your favorite flavor among these three flavors of ice cream is independent of your sex. So it doesn't matter if you're male or female, you're not going to be picking based on that. In other words, the preferences among chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry will be consistent among both groups if they were independent versus the idea that they are related in some way, that they are dependent. So that's the alternative hypothesis, that the two classifications are dependent, meaning that it matters whether you're male or female for how you'll respond when asked this question about ice cream flavors. Okay, so again, two classifications are independent versus dependent. Remember, the null hypothesis is the generic assumption that it's independent, right? So for all hypothesis testing problems involving two-way tables, we'll assume that HO is implying independence, and HA is implying dependence. All right, then from there we have a test stat, right? Our test stat formula like we've had before. Our data is provided to us in the table layout, and the test stat formula is given here. It looks a lot like the other formula we had when we had a one-way table. The big difference is, though, that we have this kind of dual notation, I and J, right? So dual subscripts, and that's because we have the kind of you know, two categories, chocolate, vanilla, male, female, so our tables have rows and columns now, not just columns, right? All right, so from there, what we're going to do is to basically perform the same exact technique we did before, except for, you know, the notation looks a little more complicated. But we'll see that it's still a sum, and it's a sum of a bunch, bunch of fractions that have this pattern of observed minus expected squared divided by expected. And then from there, we have a rejection region that's very similar to before. It's a chi-squared random variable, this test stat here. So we're going to compare that test stat against a chi-squared critical value, and that'll be found by looking up alpha on the chi-squared table, and then this special degrees of freedom. That degrees of freedom says r minus 1 times c minus 1. Now r is the number of rows you have. So how many rows do we have here? We have two rows, right? The male row and the female row. So that's two rows. So r minus 1 will become 2 minus 1, or just 1 right? Times c minus 1 for that degrees of freedom. c minus 1 is the column, the number of columns minus 1. Well, how many columns do we have? We have 1, 2, 3 columns, right? 3 columns. So that'll be 3 minus 1, and of course that'll give you 2. So finally our degrees of freedom will then be 1 times 2 or 2. So the degrees of freedom for this particular hypothesis test will be 2. All right, so that's how you figure out the degrees of freedom. It's the number of rows minus one, the number of columns minus one. Multiply those two results, and you'll get your degrees of freedom. So that would be how we look up our rejection region, and you'll see how that's done in the problem videos. Then from there, there's one little asterisk we have to pay attention to, a little important detail here, and it says that you have to make sure that each expected value is greater than or equal to five. So in order for this procedure to be valid, we have to make sure that the expected values for each of these cells each one of those is greater than or equal to 5. Otherwise, we can't use this technique. The chi-squared distribution would not apply. So we have to make sure that the expected value for every individual cell exceeds the value 5. All right, 
right, so let's see how we work out the test stat now. That's probably the most complicated part. I just want to do a couple of examples just to see. It's actually a lot of work. It's sort of uh, labor intensive to do this, but we're going to see how it's done quickly for a few examples. So let's take this first cell here. We want to figure out the expected value for that cell, and that's basically what we have to do. We have to do this for each and every cell. We have to form one of these fractions. When we're done, we have to add them all up together to get our final test stat. So let's look at what that would be. So we have observed minus expected quantity squared over expected. So here's how you fill it out for that first cell. The observed value is the value they gave us, so we'll use 225, right? The expected value is the part that people have trouble with. That's the next part that we have to do, the last part we have to do for that first cell. To get the expected value, we actually have a nice formula. The expected value is essentially equal to the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. And that will give you your expected value. Row total times column total divided by the grand total. So what I mean by row total is, if you look at where this number is located, and you look at its row, the row is here. What's the row total? It's 500. So we'd have 500 there times the column total. Well, what column is that number located, located in? It's in this column, so that would be 325 there. So we'd have 500 times 325 on top, and then divide by the grand total of 1,000. So if we fill this in, the row total again, you can see is 500. So then we would have here 500, right, times the column total, the column total is 325. And then lastly, we have divided by the grand total. That grand total is 1,000. And that's it. Let's see what that actually gives us, right? So we have 325 basically times a half, right? Because uh, 500 uh, divided by 1,000 is a half, half times 325. So you get 162.5. So our expected value is 162.5. That's the expected value, that's what would go here, 162.5, and then we would put that at the bottom of our fraction, 162.5. So that's your expected value, 162.5, your observed value is at 225. Put that all in there, we'd work out for that particular problem, that uh, fraction, get that answer, keep it on the side, work out the expected value for that, for that, for that, for that, for that, perform all those calculations, and then when we're done, we add them all up to get our test stat. It's a lot of work, right? No one would deny that. It's a lot of work. This is why software is often best used for this kind of problem. But you can see, we can get all the expected values for every cell, and we'd be ready to just plug it all into these fractions. And still, there's only one, two, three, four, five, six different cells. So once you had all the expected values, there'd be six of these fractions to perform. It's not that much work. It's doable. Let's get one more expected value just for good practice. What would the expected value be for this position, right? So if you want to know what expected value, let's just put it here. What would the expected value be for that cell? Well, it'd be, again, the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. So in this case, it'd be 500 times 450 divided by 1,000. So again, the expected value there would be 500 times the 450 divided by 1,000. And of course, in this case, um, again, 500 over 1,000 just happens to be half. So it basically say a half times 450. So that's 225. You expect to be 225 to be there. OK, so on and so forth, dot, 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 you finish it up. And that would fill in all the expected values. And once you had all the expected values, you could then fill in all of these fractions, do all the arithmetic, add all the results together, get your test stat formula. All right, so we'll do that in the problem videos, and of course those problem videos will take quite a lot of time, but um, from that you'll see all the mechanics and the details and go to practice along.